Today's Bible reading is from John chapter 12, verses 27 to 36. That's John 12, 27 to 36. Hear now God's word. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light... Believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. This is the word of the Lord. To Narelle for reading God's word to us today. Um, I would also, if I haven't met you, my name's Darren, one of the pastors here, and I would commend you um, to you, uh, Church Life, which is happening on the last Sunday of the month. And so if you're wondering what it means to be part of a church, um, or if you're considering making this church your home church, uh, please come along to Church Life, and you can register your interest at kumara.church, follow the links. That would be the uh, best, best way to start on what it looks like to be part of our church here. Well, I want to pray this morning before we enter the text, so would you join me in prayer? Father, we pray that the teaching this morning, what would be good for our souls. We ask, Lord, that it would descend like drops of rain, refreshing and filling the heart with grand and glorious thoughts of you. And we would pray this in the resurrected name of Jesus. Amen. If you've seen any of the Thor movies, you would have been exposed to Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, the idea of dying in battle was a great honor. In fact, uh, most of the Asgardian warriors in the most recent movie, Thor, wanted to die in battle so that they could enter the gates of Valhalla, which is the Norse heaven. See, for them, the, the prospect of death wasn't very troubling. In fact, it was exciting. But for us mere mortals here, the, the prospect of death is perhaps a little more troubling. I can recall uh, the birth of our first child, Dawson. Um, in, as things are happening, a, a complication arose, and as they do, more and more nurses and doctors start entering the room, and until it gets really bad when they go and press that button, and then all of a sudden, um, you've got 13, 14 medical practitioners in the room. Your wife is being carted out for an emergency C-section to save the child's life and hers, and it's all pretty wild. And I'm there, and there's that, there's that nurse who's been given the, the job to, to instruct me what to do, and they just say, follow me. And because I'd been watching Grey's Anatomy with Tegan, I knew what to do. I, I just follow you, and I just follow you, and wherever you say, and I sit down here, and I sit down, and, and so I, I just sit, and I wait, and, and by myself. The prospect of death for child and for wife is rather troubling. Teagues would also remind me that the prospect of death when our second child was also troubling for her. So, I mean, births are a wonderful thing, aren't they? But it's a prospect of death that does lay before us today, specifically the death of Jesus. Jesus is considering the reality of what he spoke about and shared last week in his teaching. So this morning, I want to talk about the way of the cross. And I want us, as John has given time here, for us to consider both the trouble and the triumph of the cross. I want us to think about it. Last week, we saw how John had recorded that Jesus was the coming king, but not the kind of king we would expect, for his way to life is through death. 
And as we, as followers of King Jesus, recognize that the cost of discipleship is demanding yet glorious, while the prospect of death is before him and he's thinking about it, the trouble and the triumph of the cross. Well, lest we think that such a life would be a walk in the park, we're brought into how it made Jesus feel. We see firstly that he feels troubled, and we'll see secondly how he responds with trust. So the realities of Jesus' death are bearing upon him. We see that in verse 27. It's kind of like the image in the distance that was out of focus has now become sharper and clearer in Jesus' mind. And so we arrive there, Jesus, and we says, my, now is my soul troubled. The arrival of the Greeks seeking Jesus has triggered his hour to come upon him. His death is impending. The forefront of his mind is a sacrificial death. So distress and agony begins to characterize his soul. Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus has felt troubled. You might recall that he felt troubled earlier when he saw Mary and the Jews weeping over Lazarus' death. He felt troubled. Later, he's going to feel troubled when he's considering how Judas will betray him. And even after that, he's going to commend to his disciples not to be troubled at his impending death. See, see, death and all these things is a troubling circumstance. Jesus feels this. This aspect of his humanity here is painted with, with kind of confronting honesty. Lazarus' death might have caused him to weep, but considering his own death causes his soul to be troubled. Kind of dread in his soul. Kind of anguish. Not an irritation, not an annoyance, not an uncomfortability of what lay ahead, but a weighty distress at the grim reality of what lay before him. Now, we aren't to think that it's simply the thought of death alone that's troubling Jesus. For many, a martyr might have died more horrific or, or um, like manner deaths. But it was rather what this death involved for him that's causing the trouble. The bearing down of the world's rebellion upon his shoulders. The, the, the sins of the people being driven into his hands through the nails. The, the collective shame and guilt of people being pressed upon his head in the crown of thorns. Guilt, sin, suffering, pain. All of this being poured out on Jesus on the cross. No wonder he says, now my soul is troubled. Though the triumph laid ahead of him, that didn't minimize the pain that was in his soul. No, there would be no compartmentalizing for Jesus. There would be no kind of distraction or diversion. There was no kind of divine wizardry he would use to minimize the pain that he is now experiencing. His humanity is confrontingly before us. Upon this hour, Jesus, Jesus becomes acutely aware that he's about to enter a whole world of trouble. As one writer said, the horror of death and the passion of obedience were meeting together. I wonder this morning, can you get a bit of a sense of the personal trouble that Jesus is facing? Can you, get a, can you kind of start to see it with incredible, even more clarity and focus? But I wonder if you can also experience the relational trouble that Jesus is experiencing. There's a kind of relational trouble because I want us to see that it's not just that Jesus is dying for sin, but he's dying for our sin, yours, mine very personal. I remember when I was younger, stealing a Turkish delight from Woolies. The glow and the allure of the purple packet and the shiny foil filled my eyes with wonder. And for some reason, I just took it and put it in my pocket. I'm not sure if I've confessed this, so my mum might be hearing about this for the first time. I stole this thing, I placed it in my pocket, I went home, and clearly because I'd done the wrong thing, I wasn't going to eat it in front of everybody. I remember beelining down the side of the fence, down the corner, where no one could see me, out of sight, and I unwrapped this thing, and I had, I had no idea what Turkish delight was, it looked good, and um, it, 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 it tasted like regret the moment I bit into it, and I've really not enjoyed Turkish delight ever since, it was a, it was a horrible dessert. Um, <laughs> But, but I tell you, there was a, there was a guilt and a, and a kind of weight that, that fell upon me in that moment. I wonder, have you, are you aware of the kind of the, the guilt and, and the shame or the burden of sin weighing upon your own shoulders? Have you, have you felt it before? 
the trouble that you feel, the pain of your own mistakes. So now imagine that kind of burden for sin being laid upon Christ himself. Now, now we feel guilt and shame, but as sinful creatures. So imagine God the Son in his holiness experiencing the filth of sin, bearing the righteous wrath of God upon him. No wonder he can say, my soul is troubled. To feel the gravity of what he experienced, I want you to take that feeling of guilt and sin in your own life you felt. I want you now to times it by, say, 200 adults that are in the room. I want you to consider all the sins of the past year of all those people. I want you now to multiply that by decades, decades of life, over thousands of churches, over hundreds of years, stretching all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden and all the way forward to the day when Christ returned. Now I want you to take all those sins, all that guilt, all that weight, and now package it together and lay it squarely on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. No wonder he can say, my soul is troubled. He's about to stare down the, the barrel of the holy wrath of God. He's about to wear this, the stain and sin and the filth of sin. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ was taking a curse upon himself. On himself. So here, the infinite God is considering the infinite price to be paid for sin. And friends, it is troubling. The way of the cross is troubling. The way of the cross is troubling. Well, if the way of the cross on his mind, what might Jesus say? What, how might he respond? Well, we see what he says next. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this very purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. See, I, I think the dread of the cross at least raises the question, should I ask to be spared from this? Shall I hold on to my life, keep it, be the seed that remains on the shelf, and survive, and survive. If Jesus was in a position later to call down 12 legions of angels to save him from the cross, surely here, a moment he can consider asking the Father to save him. He'd pray a similar prayer from a similar state in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And a similar response, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, when Jesus considers the way of the cross, he realizes and he considers that there is something far more precious than life itself. Something far more valuable. For no sooner do the words leave his lips that his purpose comes into full view. If someone looked at him and says, what say you, Jesus? Jesus says, I say to my soul, it is for this very purpose that I have come. Saving me doesn't fulfill that purpose. And I'm not about my purposes. I'm about fulfilling the Father's purpose. Therefore, what shall I say? I say, Father, glorify your name. Have your way. There is a purpose of Jesus that is higher than his own preservation. And this is the purpose that bridges him between the trouble and the trust. He returns to this purpose. It's sharpened his mind. After all, the stakes are quite high here in this consideration, aren't they? This is nothing less than the salvation of the world itself. You, you see, for, for Christ to be spared this hour would mean that his life would be retained whilst the lives of the world would be damned. Jesus would be in the clear, but the people would be left condemned. Left to sit in the pit of sin for all eternity. And any save me that they would cry would be futile. No good works, no sacrifice of blood or goats, bulls or goats would take away sin. No wonder Jesus' soul is troubled, but no wonder he stayed the course. No wonder he stayed the course. Now, we aren't to think the course ahead, the cross ahead of him was like some accident or even some kind of bad situation turned good or even a kind of mediocre consolation prize for Jesus. 
In fact, this path that laid ahead of him, the course that's mapped out, is the most glorious path. Is the most supremely wonderful path. Because on this path, it's the most honoring, God-glorifying path. Revealing his glory in majestic ways. So the request for glory is going to come at the cost of self-denial. Now, don't miss this for a moment. I think we're tempted to think that, that self-provision and self-promotion is glorious. Self-preservation, looking after my life, taking matters into my hands and keeping and squeezing everything out I can for me, that's the most glorious way to live. Jesus is saying, that's not it. The most glorious way to live is not self-preservation, but self-denial. A laying down of your purposes and saying, God, I want your name above all things, all decisions, all finances, our sexuality, everything, Lord. Your name, your glory. Father, glorify your name. Jesus says, have your way in my struggle, Father, in my inner battle, in this inner conflict where there is warfare. Would you bring peace, God, that you may be glorified? This is Jesus' posture in prayer, isn't it? Can you see it? Can, can you see how Jesus isn't denying the difficulty of what lay before him? He's feeling it. But he's also insisting on the glory of God. This is much more valuable. What Jesus is doing is he's trusting through trouble. He's trusting through trouble. You see, there's something more precious than life itself, and it's glorifying the Father. There's something Jesus loves more than life itself, and it's fulfilling the Father's purpose. Church, there is something more precious than simply trying to get ahead in life. And it's coming, and it's getting on board with fulfilling God's plans and God's purposes for our lives. I think Jesus is modeling us here as he prays what a costly life of discipleship would look like. The way of the cross, it's troubling but it is glorious to the one who trusts God's purposes. So don't be surprised if you experience kind of troubled soul or conflict as you try and follow Jesus in this world. Where you feel the, maybe the the struggle when your flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. That, That experience itself is not sin. It's part and parcel of being human this side of eternity. But, but, but let our troubles um, be more about the purposes of God than our own personal plans. Let that be what troubles us. Let us feel troubled at the cost of following Him. May each of us be troubled if we're not considering God and His glory more than ourselves and our own gain. So in such conflict, it's an opportunity to cry out for the glory of God most. To not hold tightly to our life, but rather release it. Our lives ought not to be shaped by the spare me, but rather by the glorify you. God, your glory, not mine. God, your name, not mine. God, your purpose is not mine. Your success, not mine. I want to be a seed planted. I want to lose my life for the sake of keeping it. The cost of discipleship is demanding and glorious. The way of the cross involves trusting through trouble. Or you may wonder... If we have this disposition in prayer before God, will He respond to such a prayer? Will God hear such a prayer? Will He answer? Will the Father come through? See, see, if I lay down my cause, will the Father pick up His? I think the question needs to be raised. And what we have next is a response from the Father to the Son, which is first and primary for our instruction but secondly, I think it's, it's kind of as an example for our confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence to know that when you pray, the Father hears you. For you are in Christ. And our foundation for being heard by the Father is only because the Son was heard by the Father. We find ourselves in Him. Look at the Father's response. Verse 28, then a, a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. Now, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. So can you picture the scene for me? Can you, can you kind of picture the, the cracking thunder overhead? The boom and the noise, the, the shaking, heaven shaking as it were. 
kind of like the, the rumble that happens at River Fire when the jets come by or the V8s taking off at Bathurst or um, Michael driving his AU Falcon. There's kind of a rumble, a boom. Now the noise comes. And the crowd rightly perceive that, that, that heaven has responded in some way. But they're kind of unable to determine, is this thunder, is this an angel? What exactly is this? Something's happened, some heavenly response has happened, but they're not kind of sure what it is. So when, there's mystery here in how the Father's voice is heard. Now, this isn't the first time the Father has spoken, is it? After all, we see that He'd spoken at Jesus' baptism. He's speaking here at Jerusalem, and the Father would be heard audibly again at Jesus' transfiguration. And what's interesting, in each occasion, there's a common thread that the Father is approving of the Son. He's making known His approval of who the Son is and what He does. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son. Listen to Him. So when Jesus asks that the Father's name be glorified, the question is, would it be glorified? Well, the thunder says yes. The thunder says yes. The specific words perhaps shared by Jesus to his disciples at a later point and penned here for our benefit. For the Father replied, he has glorified it and will glorify it. Here, the past tense, has glorified it, is referring to Jesus' life already, isn't it? His conduct, his teaching and his signs. Jesus has been living a life that's glorifying to the Father. In every situation, every temptation, every trial, every opposition, Jesus has responded with, Glorifying the Father's name. Jesus has kind of flexed a, a glory of God muscle, as it were, in response to life. So here, when, when he's facing trouble, when he's bearing down the impending wrath of God, when he's coming face to face with, with his purpose in life, there's a kind of reflex that Jesus already has built into himself that says, God's glory. The Father's name. There's a kind of instinct that he has. In one sense, Jesus has been training for for this kind of obedience to death his whole life. The Father's name would be glorified. I wonder, just in passing, would, would this be characteristic of us in our life? That we have daily cultivated a kind of flex that is towards the glory of God? Not the promotion or preservation or protection of self. God has glorified His name and He will continue to do it. Friends, there's no point us promising big deeds and signing up for future faithfulness if the present and the now is not, is not characterized by glorify your name. We don't want the present spare me to dominate, rather your glory Let's let us as a church cultivate this kind of reflex instinct. And it's here I hope we can see the connection between the cross and glory. This is the, the way of the cross is the way the Father's name would be glorified. Which maybe makes you ask, like, could the cross be glorious? Could the cross be glorious? The, the, the heinous death, the, the death, the death of the dread of wrath. Wouldn't you think if, if the Son of God was being lifted up on a cross? that in fact, um, kind of like Satan's name itself would look like he's being honored and his victory is being touted and, and everyone thinks that the devil's won? Isn't this the apex of evil, an attempt to destroy the, the glory of God on the cross? Well, as John Piper put so clearly, the apex of evil achieved the apex of the glory of Christ. The worst thing evil could do in this world is murder the Son of God. And the worst thing evil did only served to reveal the glory of God with tremendous clarity. The very thing they were seeking destroyed was turned on themselves, the enemy. Scoring a goal might be glorious, but not a known goal. So when Jesus' life is not spared, but rather lifted up, this is the greatest revelation of glory. 
God's grace is going to be magnificently seen. The Father's name is going to be highly exalted to the Son atoning for sin. How glorious He bore our sins on the cross. How glorious that our iniquities were laid upon Him. How glorious that it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. How glorious that a way for forgiveness could be created. How glorious that the enemy would be disarmed and people would be drawn to Him. How does such glory and gruesome go together? That's the paradox of the cross. Sin is being atoned for, God's glory is being revealed. See, we can only sing the chorus of how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song, song shall ever, and my soul shall ever sing. We can only sing that because of what? The verse. He took my sin and my sorrow and made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. That's why I can sing, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever sing. No wonder the Father said, I will glorify it again. This is why the Father voice thundered from heaven. See in verse 30, Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake and not mine. And so by implication, in one sense, us here today, the voice came so that we would know. Jesus, of course, didn't need an audible voice of the God to the audible voice of God to know that the Father had heard his prayer. Son and the Father in communing constantly. So there was something about the Father's verbal, audible response here that was for the benefit of the listeners. But they needed to know that the Father would glorify his name through Jesus. And what would it look like to glorify the name? Jesus says, I want to glorify your name, Father. The Father says, I will glorify it. So what's that going to look like? Well, I think that's what we get in verse 31 and 32. And to paraphrase it, kind of what's happening here, it kind of goes something like this. This is kind of answering the question, in what sake is the Father's voice being audibly heard but not discernibly understood? To paraphrase, reckons like this. Jesus says, hey, you, you know how I just asked the Father that, 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 to glorify His name? Well, that thunderous response you heard, yeah, that was him saying, yep. And, and you know what that glory is going to look like? Well, it's going to look like my triumphant death, where the rule of this earth will be disarmed and that all people will be drawn to me. Glory to the Father's name means the Son's life is not spared. Glory to the Father's name means Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Jesus says, the voice you heard has come for your sake, not mine. To so listen in. Listen in to what the Father's saying here. Listen in to Jesus explaining it, because He's not saying it for His sake. He's saying it for ours. This isn't the first time Jesus has prayed out loud for the sake of others. John eleven forty one to 42, He prayed out loud so that people seeing the resurrected Lazarus would believe that He is the Son of God, that, Jesus, that the Father has sent Him. When Jesus is praying out loud here, it isn't to reveal the resurrection, but rather an execution. His purpose is that they be drawn in. You would hear so you may see. Glory would be seen like a life laid down, a seed buried in the ground. Friends, the way of the cross is, tro is troubling. The way through that is through trust. But friends, we see the way of the cross is actually triumphant. Look now in verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Oh, there is so much that could be said about what's happening on the cross. I would commend to you the book, John Stott, The Cross of Christ, if you want to get a full picture of what's going on on the cross. But not least of which ha is happening here. Jesus is saying the hammer's coming down. The devil's being kicked out, and the people are being drawn in. She's bringing the hammer down through judgment. So this is ironic because the religious leaders thought they were judging Jesus, by sending him to the cross, weren't they? They're pronouncing judgment on him, and yet, in reality, Jesus is judging them by their evil deeds. So the kind of warning shot has been fired, as it were. You want to see how sin will be judged on that final day? Well, the verdict is in. This is how sin will be judged. This is how evil deeds are dealt with. Jesus absorbing the wrath of God. Come to God through faith in Jesus, and you'll see the judgment has already taken place. But avoid the cross and you'll be left to that judgment. Now is the judgment of the world. 
Secondly, the, the ruler is kicked out. So the captain of the proverbial world ship is also going down. The evil one who sought to defeat Jesus by the cross kind of discovers he's, he's kind of shot a suicidal blow, an own goal. It wasn't just that he put his foot in it. Rather, he got his foot caught under the heel of Jesus. Remember the prophecy back in Genesis 3? Serpent may have bruised his head. The Son of Man will crush his head. So the serpent may bruise his heel. The Son of Man will crush his head. Kind of like a bee sting, thinking I've dealt the fatal blow, but it's costing himself position and prominence. The crucifixion of Jesus was the very act that disarmed the devil, cast him from his position of power. You remember those, those escalators in shopping centers? There's one going up and there's one going down. That's the kind of picture I have in mind here. Jesus is on the escalator traveling up and, and Satan's been toppled down. And he's, just, he's on his way down. Satan's being dethroned. Jesus is heading forward to be in front. See, the ruler of this world is the devil himself. Satan, the accuser, the evil one. He's called the ruler of this world because he has a power over humans in their sinful state. One of the ways that he seeks, the enemy seeks to destroy people is by accusing them before God, condemning them for their sin. And yet at the cross, Jesus is disarming that power. Jesus is breaking it. For Jesus comes now not to accuse, but to advocate, not to condemn, but to comfort. Those who've come to the cross, freely confessed their sins, received his forgiveness, the devil's power doesn't have a hold. You stand clear before a righteous God. So friends, when Satan points out sin in your life, to accuse and condemn, would you let him know two things? Would you let him know, one, that it's far worse than he realizes? That he's only got the tip of the iceberg to how sinful you actually are? And then point him to the cross and say, and it's all been dealt with. Let him know he can take it up with Jesus. He has no power. He's going down. Finalized and finished. The enemy is cast out. Now, a good movie ending doesn't simply involve the bad guys before a judge and the ringleader in jail. We, it also needs to do some good, right? And so that's what we see in verse 32. When I, when, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He's drawing people to himself. So Jesus here is speaking of his crucifixion and his exaltation. A symbol of crucifixion is kind of made clear in verse 33. Well, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. What kind of death was he going to die? The kind that he got lifted up, a, a crucifixion. So there's a literal sense in which this is speaking about the death he would die. But there's also a kind of another sharp edge in this lifting up in that it, it speaks of the exaltation the glorification of Jesus through the cross. This lifting up is the very mechanism through which sin is punished, forgiveness made possible. That's why the lifting up is glorious. That's why we can exalt in the cross. The, Jesus dying on the cross isn't, isn't glorious because Jesus is doing a nice thing. It, it's not glorious because he's simply setting a nice example of, of how to love people. No, it's glorious because of what it effected. Holy wrath of God poured out against sin. Jesus is absorbing. Jesus is atoning for all our iniquities, paving a way for reconciliation with the Father. The cross becomes then like a light drawing people in to the source of light, Jesus himself, the incarnate word. He is the light of the world that they must see. He is the bread of life that they must eat of. He is the living water that they must drink of. He is the door they must enter. He is the good shepherd whose voice they must hear. And he will lay down his life for his, for his sheep. And all these pictures are kind of coming together, supremely seen, patched together at the cross to see Jesus. The Greeks, when asked the question to Andrew, we want to see Jesus. Jesus says, I'll let you see me. See me when I'm lifted up. That's the clearest picture of Jesus on the cross. You want to know what God's like? Come to the cross. This forgiveness and mercy meet. His death will draw all people to himself, all sorts of people, Jews and non-Jews alike. Now, when you hear all people here, we aren't to think that all people means every person in the entire world. For one, we know that there are many who do not believe. 
See, the all here, I like how Don Carson puts it so succinctly. It means all people without distinction, not all people without exception. All kinds of people. I mean, just look around this room for a moment, which the introverts won't do, but the two extroverts chose to. But if you look around, there's an odd bunch here. All kinds of people. All different walks of life. What's drawn us here today? Well, by God's grace, it's because you are aware of the God-man Jesus who died on the cross for forgiveness of sin. The gospel of Christ has drawn you in, brought a people together. That's why it's glorious. No wonder the Father said, I will glorify it again. The cross of Christ is undeniable in its ability to draw people to himself. The, The substitutionary death of Jesus has like a magnetic pull to it. It pulls them in. Every nation Believers, brings them in to believe upon Him, receive Him as Savior. That's the centerpiece. This is, the, this is what the signs are pointing to. This is what His teaching has been about. Look, you want to see me? Look at my death. Here it is. This has been true for centuries. The cross of Christ has a drawing impact and effect. Where the story of the gospel is preached, people are drawn. When Jesus is proclaimed and lifted up, people are drawn to Him, every race, type, and place. I remember my theology lecturer who... Um, did a lot of evangelistic preaching in the 80s and the 90s. Shout out 90s. Um, he, 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 in all his sermons, he said what he just noticed was that the sermons, when he just centered the most on the cross, they were just the sermons that had, had the most salvation responses. So he just kept focusing on the cross. Why? Because when the Son of Man is lifted up, he draws people to himself. That's how it works. The way of the cross is the way to life. It's a way through death, the death of Christ. My death will draw people, says Jesus. You want an image of who I am? Look to the cross. Such an image of the exalted, lifted up Christ, though, is is still yet to be exhausted, isn't it? Because there's another kind of exaltation. There's another kind of lifting up that's still to happen for Jesus, isn't there? On that day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, The Lamb who was slain will be seated on the throne of glory and all nations, friends, and foe will be before Him. Jesus' word will draw all people up out of their graves to be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. That great and terrible day is coming. There's more coming, but now the decisive step has been taken. The cross has made that clear. Jesus would be lifted up. The enemy would be disarmed and people would be drawn to Himself. This is the way of the cross. It was a way of trouble. It is a way of triumph. It is one of vexation and victory. So this is the way of the cross. I want this morning, what might our response to it be? With this in mind, what might we respond to the cross? Well, let's look at how the crowds respond. And you can see that the crowds kind of respond with a degree of confusion, don't they? They're, they're kind of unsure how to put all the pieces together. See that in verse 34? So the crowd answered him, We've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So the the crowd knew their Bible. What's the deal with the Messiah dying is basically what they're asking. What kind of Messiah is that? Quick question, aren't Messiahs supposed to live forever? Seed on the throne of David forever? How can you say that this Son of Man is going to die? That can't be. How can it be? See, whilst they think to live forever means you must not die, in Jesus' economy, to live forever necessitates that he must die. The seed bears fruit only if it dies. It is only those who hate their life in this world that will keep it for eternal life. Remaining forever will happen for the Messiah, Resurrection will come, glorification will come, but it will come through the necessary effectual death of Jesus. So John's original audience is going to have to grapple with this question like the crowd was grappling. What do we make of this Son of Man? What do we make of Jesus? Will we receive Him as He is? Will we take Him as he, at His word? We will believe upon His life, death, and resurrection. And I think we too today need to grapple with this question. Who is this Jesus? Who is this one that dies for the glory of the Father's name to produce eternal life? What will we make of him? 
I pray that we take Jesus at his word. And lastly, I pray that we take Jesus at his word today, that we do not hesitate. Jesus' final instruction is to decide now. Look at me in verse 35. Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. The light is Jesus. Death is coming, so time is short. Jesus is saying, whilst you've got it, whilst you've got me, walk in the light. There's been a lot of uh, flooding around southeast Queensland this year and now the east coast of Australia in general, particularly right now in Victoria. And with the flooding comes these orders, it's the evacuation orders. Notice, to evacuate, you leave now. Sadly, when those um, evacuation orders aren't heeded, by the time people decide to evacuate, well, they're often trapped in by the floodwaters. Jesus is saying, he's saying, heed the warning now. Take me at my word. Trust in the signs. It, It won't be any easier to believe after the cross. It's going to be more troubling. It won't be easier to walk in the light. Believe in me now with what you know and with what's been revealed. Listen, you ain't no glow bug. You ain't able to bring light out. You just struggle walking in darkness. You can't light the way yourself. Whilst Jesus is here, believe in him, that you too may be sons of light. That is, that you may walk morally and live morally upright lives, ethically light, may walk in eternal life, fullness of life. This is a warning that from Jesus is true for every generation that hears it. The door to salvation will not remain open forever. There is a time where it shall be shut. So today, right now, in this moment, I plead with you, if you are yet to believe upon the Son of Man, if you are let to, if you are yet to surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus and ask for forgiveness of sin, if you are yet to see Jesus as glorious, turn to Him today, away from your sin and trust Him. There is no gain in delaying. You either run the risk of hardening your heart or you run the risk of dying before you respond. You don't know. So respond today. And Christian, if you've made this decision, would you be reminded of the urgency of time? And would your life look like you've responded to the light, that you are walking in the light as one who has responded? In the screw tape letters written by C.S. Lewis, uh, an older demon, screw tape, is trying to train the younger demon, Wormwood, on effective strategies to keep people on the pathway to damnation. And I came across a little script that was inspired by the screw tape letters. So this is not C.S. Lewis' direct quote. This is an inspirational story made up to kind of convey similar ideas. And it goes something like this. Once the devil decided to hold a competition to see which of his demons could come up with the best scheme to stop ordinary people seeking God and finding him. Devil says, righto, listen up. The enemy has been too successful in recruiting mortals to his cause. We need to step up and find a new strategy. You've volunteered five ideas, so let's hear them. First demon speaks up, simple. I shall tell them there is no God. Don't be an idiot, said the devil. They only have to look at the wonders of creation, their own humanity, heck, even a a tiny baby that they will see and catch on that something is greater than what they see and touch in this world. Second demon spoke up. Well, I shall tell them that there is no such thing in this world as evil and that they can do as they like. No, that won't wash either, said the devil. If they look too closely, they'll see the shadow of evil lurking around every corner. They'll see it in the lives of broken people who lose their ways. So, no, no, think again. The third demon said, I shall persuade everyone 
that churches are not in fashion and definitely not cool and that they have evil intentions. Well, the devil yawns. They already think this way. Koshi got there first. The fourth demon spoke up. I have a much better plan. In fact, this plan's foolproof. I'll encourage mortals to become addicted to media. From waking until falling asleep, the first thing they look at and the last thing they close before the night is over. Soon they'll spend their times in a, in a kind of comatose state. Mmm, said the devil. But won't there still be a time when they become disenchanted or disinterested with such TV media? TikTok then. Disney Plus, streaming services, Wordle. You name it, we'll throw everything at them. I shall lay before them a device in their hand, in their rooms, screens to catch their eye, promising connection without deliverance, distracting themselves to death. The devil says, well, I'm still not sure that would catch every single second. But well done, keep on trying. The last demon spoke up and said, uh, I have an idea. Well, come on, speak up, said the devil. Oh, I'm, just, I'm not sure. Not sure what? Spit it out. Let's have it. Well, my, my plan, your, your greatness, is a simple one. Well, share it. Well, I thought I would just go and persuade them that they have plenty of time in which to respond. As the devil raises his head slowly, the most delightfully evil grin races across his face. Yes, excellent. Now go and do it. I've got time to respond to God. I just got a few things to get in order first. God will understand. I'm just trying to process a few things right now and I'll, I'll deal with God later. Jesus says, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. Now is the time. Church, the triumph of the cross means you can trust him through trouble. The way of the cross says, Father, glorify your name more than preserving myself. So come trouble or triumph, I pray this morning that we would trust in the Savior who was lifted up that we may be drawn to him. Let's pray.